question. Um, just so you guys understand why it is that we're here, this uh, form was the vision of Lynn Jennings, who's the Educational Programs Manager at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, one of the requirements for Congressional Black Caucus Fellows is to participate in a community service project. Um, and so in addition to attempting to provide um, actual um, experiences and opportunities for individuals to learn what it's like to be staffers on Capitol Hill, the fellows are responsible for pulling together a project. And so um, I was a fellow in 06 working in the office of Congressman Rangel, and what we decided to do as a cohort was to pull together a mock Congress. Uh, we developed a curriculum, went into three schools, one in D.C., two in Maryland, mm -hmm. and provided kids with an opportunity to better understand the legislative process, um, and then invited them into the Capitol building. Um, and so what we wanted to do is have a conversation about the importance of service, um, especially at a time in which a lot of people are focused on economic and, and, and financial gains. Um, and so what I want to do is give you guys a few statistics just to ground our conversation. I'm then going to go down the panel and give you guys a, a brief introduction to our panelists. Um, and then I'll ask each of them a, a question just to um, begin sort of uh, the thoughts germinating in you guys' heads. And then after that, we're honestly going to have a conversation. Um, I will then turn it to you and then open up the floor for questions. And then we'll just engage until time expires. Um, and so everyone knows. Um, Earlier this year, we passed in Congress, um, what I didn't say is that my day job is working in the United States Senate uh, in the HELP Committee as a senior policy advisor, mostly working on education and labor issues. I now work for Chairman Tom Harkin, but prior to uh, him assuming the leadership of the, the committee, I worked for Senator Edward Kennedy. Um, and one of the last things we accomplished under his tenure was to pass the Serve America Act. Um, and that bill does a couple of things that are relevant. Um, one is establishes summer of service programs to provide $500 educational awards to students in uh, grades 6 through 12, as well as youth engagement um, zones. And so that's for students who are disconnected or who have dropped out of school in order to help them engage in service projects. Um, it also provided um, $2 million in grants to 17 nonprofit organizations and schools so that they can engage um, students in uh, grades 6 through 9 in, in, in innovative service projects focused on addressing environmental and disaster preparedness issues. And Quentin will come to you with um, a question that's relevant in that regard. Uh, and one other thing that it did was provide $16 million over the next two years to nonprofit organizations to address the needs of low-income children in Ohio, District of Columbia, California, North and South Carolina, and Oklahoma. Um, and the long and short of it is that this bill was uh, Senator Kennedy's and really his family's, um, Eunice Shriver and other people's um, commitment to service as a legacy. Um, and it's the federal government's investment in that going forward. Um, and so what we want to do is introduce our panelists who are all working in varying capacities, both domestically and internationally, um, to uh, advance service in, in, in many ways. Before we do that, I want to uh, welcome to the mic Julia Sessoms, uh, uh, a young woman who is, I'm honored to call her a friend, but she's doing great things. She um, was formerly with the Raven Group and is currently uh, with Pepsi. Um, so she's going to deliver some welcoming remarks on behalf of our sponsor. Thank you, David. And I'll just say that um, I'm, I'm with PepsiCo. And many of us don't know that PepsiCo also includes brand Pepsi, but Tropicana, Frito-Lay, Gatorade, and um, a, a range of other products that you're, you're very familiar with and I think Americans love and enjoy. So I, I wanted to make sure that we, we knew that we have a, a, a wide-ranging portfolio. So on behalf of Indra Nui, our CEO, and our 280,000 employees around the world, I just wanted to say congratulations to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation on their 40th anniversary. It's an impressive feat and accomplishment. And PepsiCo is proud to be a sponsor of the CBCF Alumni Series. Um, the, C the series uh, kicked off yesterday, and I hope that you were part of that conversation with the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, talking about the ABCs of student learning. And she had a lot of incredible things to say um, about child nutrition and access to uh, healthier foods and energy balance. So we at PepsiCo um, support her initiative, and I, I wanted just to address a couple of the things that um, we are doing in order to create um, a healthier generation of youth. So answering her calls um, for innovative initi initiatives, we 
uh, have done a range of things, including partnering in the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation, where we joined her through the Partnership for a Healthy America to announce a pledge to remove 1.5 trillion calories from Americans' diets. And this is gonna be a commitment that is independently evaluated by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So we're making changes in the marketplace, in schools, and also in the workplace. We're also, uh, we've also taken beverages out of schools. I'm not sure how many of you know about that, but since 2006, we've removed 88% of calories from the school environment, and we've really changed the beverage environment um, for students. At PepsiCo, we don't market um, beverages to kids, and we do that globally, and our commitments are global. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those points because we are very supportive of her Let's Move agenda. We work with her and we've made these commitments with her and her foundation. Um, and if you care about creating a healthier community, I encourage you to check out the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation. But today is really about Ready, Set, Engage, which is gonna be an incredible and important dialogue about how we can make change in our community. And at PepsiCo, we say that every generation refreshes the world. Just taking, um, taking a survey of the audience, how many of you know about the Pepsi Refresh Project, supported by brand Pepsi? That's terrific. So I wanted to highlight that we are uh, sponsoring innovative, um, optimistic ideas awarding more than $20 million in 2010 to help communities create and uh, create and, and achieve whatever they'd like to achieve. So this process is a very transparent one. You go online, you submit a grant, you drive people online in order to vote for that grant. And we have one of our grant winners here today, and I'm very excited to, to learn um, more about what our other panelists are doing. But I encourage everyone to visit refresheverything.com so that you can submit your ideas. Um, so again, I wanna thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Lynn Jennings, who supports this alumni series. And um, I look forward to the impressive panel today. Um, so the People's Ball was uh, probably one of the most talked about events simply because during inauguration, everyone and their state put on a ball and uh, many of them came with very expensive price tags and some brilliant men had the idea that um, these things should be accessible to the people, the people who um, have helped to elect the person who we were celebrating at that time and people who otherwise wouldn't be able to um, contribute. And so Mr. Earl Stafford is the chairman and chief executive officer of the, am I saying that right, your last name, Stratford? Stafford? Stafford. The Stafford Foundation Incorporated. Uh, he is responsible for the People's Ball. Um, he, in addition to that, as a former member of the U.S. Air Force, he's dedicated a lot of time and, and an extreme amount of resources to um, several philanthropic projects. Um, but one thing that I just want to say is that um, a quote from um, Mr. Stratford is that, the hope is that this will be contagious and that this in context is his philanthropic investments. That others will say, I can do a little good. I might not be able to hold an inaugural ball or celebration, but I can do something for my neighbor without condition, without return. It's Earl Stafford. Seated next to him is Vanessa Hawkins. Vanessa Hawkins is executive director of First of Atlanta, a youth development organization that teaches life skills to young people through the game of golf. Seated next to her is Stephanie Jones, president of Stephanie Jones Strategies LLC. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, Stephanie is a very good friend of mine. Um, prior to assuming this position, leading her own organization, she uh, was the president um, and executive director of the Policy Institute for the National Urban League. In that capacity, she was responsible for all of their policy and, and, and public policy engagement, but also produced the State of Black America Report, which is an annual report um, that synthesizes the state of uh, African Americans throughout this country. Seated next to her is Jeff Franco, executive director of City Year of Washington, D.C. Um, he is responsible for managing the DC site, raising the site's $3.1 million budget and overseeing the program service, recruitment, training, and evaluations component. When asked why it is that he works with uh, City Year, he said, I serve because I believe that young people have the power, energy, and idealism to really change the world. Seated to his right is Nicole Lindsay. She is the executive director of New York Needs You. 
New York Needs You works to close the opportunity gap for first-generation students through an intensive career development and leadership training fellowship that enables high potential first-generation college students to realize their full potential. And before working in this capacity, she worked with management leadership training for tomorrow. Seated next to Nicole is Adriana Logalbo. Did I get that right? Perfect. Perfect. It's practicing. She is the campaign director for Nothing But Nets Campaign, a global grassroots effort to save lives by preventing malaria, the leading killer of children in Africa. Um, Nicole has led uh, campaign efforts have, which have resulted in raising more than $30 million for this effort. Um, and under her leadership, they've distributed more than 3 million nets across Africa. And last but certainly not least is my fraternity brother and good friend, Quentin James. That's not why he's on the panel, but I think they're important <laughs> to note. Um, Quentin is, get the title right, because Quentin does lots of things. Um, he's a policy associate with Green for All. Uh, a native of Greenville, South Carolina. He is a political science student who recently graduated from Howard University. Um, he uh, is also, is it, what's the title, is president? The NAACP position? National board. Nash, he's on the national board of the NAACP and is also a former CBCF intern. Uh, please join me in giving a round, welcoming round of applause to our panelists. Um, and I know that you also have a new initiative that I'd like for you to, to talk about as well. Um, but there, I remember at the time in which a lot of this was going on, some people sort of questioned why it was that you would do such a thing. Um, I guess the question I'd like for you to respond to is, how do we spur the type of unselfishness that was embodied in, in, in pulling together the people's ball? Um, what are the things that we can and should be doing to encourage more people to follow in your footsteps? Well, boy, a couple questions there. <clears throat> First of all, the People's Inaugural Project, as it was called, to bring people in from across the nation, the underserved, the disadvantaged, or whatever term we place on them, um, was an inspiration. I, I try to live my faith. I'm a Christian. I stand up and, 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 and tell that. But I was led to do that. Little did I ever expect the publicity and, 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 and uh, the things that came along with that. Our intent was just to focus on the people. Uh, if you will recall, during that time, banks were failing, investment uh, companies were failing, the auto industry was down, and things were happening, and we were looking, how do we save and bail these institutions out, but the people were hurting. And so what we wanted to do was not, our intent was not to throw a big party, but our intent was to try to put some focus on the people, that there are many people out there that are hurting. And what we wanted to do was to inspire others, uh, not to throw a ball or, or feed 5,000, but feed one, you know? Even in our imperfect situations, all of us are hurting and have issues. You can still do a little good. There's always someone worse off than you are. So that was really our intent, and um, uh, we did that, the uh, People's Inaugural Project. We were committed to continue to working with them after the project. I've often said that anyone can throw a party, but the real commitment, the show of your commitment comes when the cameras are off and the media is no longer interested in your story. You know, what are you doing then? Um, so we made a commitment to stay with the uh, 40 organizations that we brought in and the individuals there to see how we could continue to serve to help them help themselves. One of the lessons that we, that as we look back on the event, one of the uh, lessons learned, we saw that there were over 9,000 telephone calls and emails from people across the country and even internationally of people who were not looking necessarily for a ticket to attend the event, but people who were asking, how can I help? And then how can I get involved? And as we looked at that, we realized that in this country, there's a pent up demand for people who want to do good. But as ludicrous as it sounds, many don't know how to. You know, many don't know how to get involved and to give a little. And we talk about philanthropy and people think that you have to write seven digit checks to be a philanthropist. No, all you have to do is give what you can. You know, get involved. And in the Stafford Foundation, we have a logo. You know, give a, give a, give a dollar, give an hour. You know, just, just give a little bit. And if we do this, we think we can have an impact on the community. I had a chapter that's in the city of Atlanta they put a lot of time and effort into developing a full-fledged curriculum that has been researched to show that if used with the game of golf, it will teach valuable life skills to children with the goal 
of getting them to live and model the nine core values. And those include honesty, integrity, judgment, perseverance, and there are others. Confidence being one of the main ones. At the first tier of Atlanta, I was inspired to get involved. I first started out as a parent there. And when I saw that parents were, first of all, very excited about the opportunity to bring their children into a sport that they otherwise would not have an opportunity to engage in. Golf can be thought of as a very expensive sport, and it can be for some people. But the way the first tee is set up in the city of Atlanta, you join our particular program for $25. And you can get that for a full eight-week session. And if you can't afford that, it's free. And you have access to a golf course and a range. But there are some things you must do when you bring your child in. Your child must, uh, uh, must begin to participate fully in the curriculum. And the curriculum teaches them things like the rules of, um, the rules of conduct. The first he has a, a set of uh, rules. And one of them is, I will respect myself. Now that's very powerful, I will respect myself. Because included in I will respect myself is, I will dress appropriately. But then it also says, I will catch myself doing something good. And that's very important to a child to think that I should look for something that I'm doing good to congratulate myself or to say to myself, I'm okay. Because believe it or not, children, especially children who have the least, are oftentimes put down. So for them to catch themselves doing something good and say, you know what, I'm okay, that's a very powerful thing. It's a good place for them to start. So imagine as you're teaching golf, you're saying to a child, we're going to learn the three tips for having fun. Be patient, be positive, ask for help. So you think, now how do you do that? Well, I'll give you one quick example. We'll give the children three paper clips, let's say. We say put three paper clips in your right pocket or three T's in your right pocket. As we go through the lesson, we say every time you find yourself not being positive, take a T out of your right pocket and put it in your left pocket. At the end of that 90 minute lesson, you say, how many T's do you have? in your right pocket. Because you want children to start thinking positive about themselves and positive about, about their abilities. It doesn't matter that I can't hit the ball as far as you can hit it, but I did what was good for me. So I was positive, I didn't get down on myself. So it's a full-fledged curriculum. We go from age seven to 17. We're in session because we're in Atlanta year round. You have a chapter here in, in uh, Washington, D.C. called the First T of Washington, D.C. And one of the uh, program is housed at Langston, and I understand that's one of the oldest golf courses, maybe in the nation, African American golf co uh, golf coach, uh, courses, I should say. We're open to children from all backgrounds, but we are over overwhelmingly uh, African American, 97 percent. So, again, as I said, it's a full full fledged uh, curriculum that has been tested to show that it is very effective at teaching children to gain confidence in themselves, to have respect for themselves and for others, and even to respect their environment. And as we talk more, I'll talk about some of the environmental things that we'll be doing this week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right before the panel, Ms. Jones and I were talking about um, how important it is to catch people when they're excited. Um, and, and I think anyone who was anywhere around Washington, D.C. in January of this year will uh, be hard-pressed to forget the excitement around the inauguration of, of the president. Um, and as we think about November uh, soon approaching and the conversations that we're hap are happening, happening now around um, the elections, one of the, the questions that I have is um, how you get people involved. Um, so Stephanie, um, given your perspective and your background, I'm hoping you can talk to how it is that we encourage um, uh, political engagement, uh, particularly at times when folks aren't excited about it. Thanks, David. Um, Political engagement is often not looked at as service. It's seen as something separate and often something very self-serving. But, pol but political activism is one of the most important services you can help to provide to your community. And working in the community to help develop um, political activism and political knowledge is a very critical thing I think that we can all do. One of the things that I think tends to pull us down is this notion that uh, political activity and political involvement is sort of a one-shot, one-off deal, that you, you work really hard in the months leading up to an election, you get the vote out, you know, you get the buses, you get to, the, you know, you get all the folks out, you get them to the polls, and then you, 
you know, you go to the election night party and you all have a really great time and, you know, you get your, you get your person elected and you feel great about it, then um, when it's something as, as large and monumental as, the, as, as um, President Obama's election, then that kind of carries out for a few months. So we, you know, we celebrated for months, we had the balls, we did all these great things. And then many of us then sat back and said, okay, That's right. he's got it and he's going he's to look after us and we got this, we've got this president. And now, as the, as the midterms are approaching, you're finding a lot of discontent and a lot of pissed off people. And we're saying, well, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. And I'm not happy about this. Now, we can all, you know, we can go back and forth on, you know, on you know, whether there were any lost opportunities, whether there was more that the president could have done, whether he should have done things differently. But so much of of the political activity and the, and, the, and the political strength that a president has or any other elected official is based on what we give them after the election. Um, and I'm just curious, how many, how many of us have since, um, let's just say in the last two years, have written a letter, sent an email, or made a phone call to a member of Congress? That's very good, that's very good because we don't often see that kind of engagement. We sort of expect them to do, they're representing us, so go represent us. But they need to hear from us. They need us to push them. They need us, and not just push them because they're gonna do the wrong thing, but they're in a bubble. They need to know what their constituents think and what they want and what they want them to do. They need to hear from us. But in addition to that, they need us even before that. They need us to help them develop their policies and to develop their initiatives because they're not, you know, they're not sitting there in a vacuum. They've got to come up with plans. They've got to come up with policies. They've got to figure out bills to introduce. They've got to, to think of how they're going to vote on certain things. And they really need us to help educate them. Um, in addition to that, not only do they need us to help educate them, but they need us to help build them uh, what my father always refers to as building backfires. You gotta, you know, you gotta build a backfire for somebody. You gotta help them um, not only, if they're, gonna do the, if, if they're gonna do the right thing, often they're gonna get hit hard for it. We need to help them um, build the support they need in order to do what we want them to do, but also to stave off some of the opposition. And if we look at, for, and for example, if we look at um, things that have been happening just in recent months, we're seeing, we're seeing the Tea Party. Okay? We're seeing um, anti-Muslim, um, this, this terrible anti-Muslim furor. Um, we're seeing a real shift to the right in a lot of our politics. And as a result, I'm seeing a lot of our, our politicians, a lot of um, members of Congress and senators feeling like they better shift over to the right. They better move over to the right so that they can get, well, you know why they're doing that? Because that's who they're hearing from. That's who they're hearing from. They're thinking, they're, they're in this position, they're thinking, my constituency is moving to the right, I, I've got to respond to this if I want to keep my office. They need to be hearing from us as well. They need to hear from us, not just when it comes time for elections, but all along so that they know there's a much broader constituency out here. Um, and we do that, it's important to do that not only when this is a politician, for example, a member of Congress that you voted for and that you supported. It's also important to do that, to, even, if the, even if the candidate that you supported didn't win, it's critical to make yourself a constituency, to be a constituency to whoever's in office because they're gonna wanna run again. And, and most likely they're gonna run again, they're going to need support, and even if they don't think you're necessarily going to vote for them, they don't want, if, if they see that you're a strong constituency with a voice, who's out talking, who's out talking to people, who's engaged, they're not going to want you coming out really hard against them. And so it's important, what happens after the election in between Novembers is just as important as what happens leading up to November. Um, we have a lot more strength than we think we do. And I, especially when it comes to our voices and our knowledge about what's going on, on in our communities that can educate public policy makers. Um, I'll just t tell you a brief story. I used to work for John Edwards, um, a senator from North Carolina. And one of the things I did with him, you know, he, had a he was very strong on civil rights. He was, he, was, he was excellent on civil rights. And when something would come up, maybe a bill would come up with um, either um, that we thought was bad for civil rights or something that was very good. One of the first things he would ask me is, well, what do, what do the groups say about it? What are they saying? He wanted to know what the, 
National Urban League, what the NACP, what La Raza, what these different organizations were saying, because he wanted to know, you know, what are folks thinking? Where are people on this? He wanted to know, in addition to that, what are people, we, we, we get letters where people would call and they'd write. He wanted to know what, what the folks were writing and, and calling and saying. One of the things that was very difficult about that is I was okay with the groups. You know, the groups were, you know, they, you know, they made sure I knew what, what folks were thinking and, and it was great. But when it came time to the letters and the phone calls, often most of the letters and the phone calls were from people who were opposed to whatever we were trying to do. And so one of the things I would do is I would call folks up and say, look, you have got to start writing some letters. I can't, you know, I'm, you know, the senator wants to do what you want him to do, but I need to give him something that's going to let him know he is not going to get killed politically if he does it. He's got to have some support to do this. And so, and, and by doing that, I was able to help generate some, you know, some interest in the folks who were on the ground who were interested in what we were doing, but didn't, felt that they really didn't have a say and needed to make sure people know you have a say. They actually read those letters. David knows. They read these letters. They, they listen to these phone calls. They're paying attention to what their constituents are saying. But if they're not hearing from us, then you're giving somebody else a voice. And, and I think that's one of the things we're seeing with what's going on with the Tea Party. Tea Party is only that big. You know, there's not a lot of people. But they, they're loud, and they talk a lot, and they do a lot that gets them attention. The media... Um, likes shiny objects and things that are interesting and exciting, and there's a vacuum out there. there there's a big vacuum where people aren't saying, you know, people aren't speaking up about issues that we care about. So it's left this vacuum for forces that um, don't necessarily have our interest in mind. So I think it's very, very important to just remember your power. Um, we all have tremendous political power, and we need to use that um, not just leading up to elections, but after elections when being a constituency is one of the most important things in terms of political activism that we can do. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll definitely come back to that. Um, one of the things you mentioned early on was the importance of uh, things bubbling up from the grassroots level um, up, up up through the ranks. Um, City Year is an organization that has existed for quite some time. Um, I think that, um, to Stephanie's point, many of the uh, initiatives that the Obama administration has encouraged um, will continue to be debated, um, but something that we can't deny now is that in the last year or two, we've seen an increased focus on service, and in part, um, sort of a spotlighting of the work that your organization does. Um, I guess acknowledging that as the context, um, what are you most excited about as you think about the work that City Year has to engage in in the time to come? Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the vision of City Year has always been that every, one day every young person will ask another young person, where did you do your year of service? Um, with the belief that we have that young people can not change the world. David mentioned the uh, Serve America Act that was passed in 2009. Um, a big part of that act is really a triple the size of funding available for young people that want to serve in uh, youth service organizations like City Year. Uh, this year, uh, we have 140 core members. Um, we unite 17 to 24 year olds that come together to dedicate one year of their lives to serving their community, primarily in the schools, DC public schools, serving the children in the elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as doing service and beautification projects throughout the city. And we have, just to give you an idea about how young people really started to embrace this idea. In the past three years, um, the size of our core, our, our dedicated volunteers, has, has uh, doubled in size. We're at 140 core members this year. And um, we had over 760 applications for this year's class of core members. So I think there's a recognition by the larger community, wow, these young people, these energetic, diverse, inclusive young people really can make an impact. And one of the impacts we want to make is certainly on the educational system. If you look at the uh, largest urban centers in the country, the graduation rate hovers between 50 and 60 percent. It's really, Colin Powell called a national catastrophe, the dropout crisis, and it is. And the recognition that young people, you can actually make an impact in trying to make sure these kids either stay on track to graduate or get back on track if they have fallen off is really a, a large burden and a real great recognition of the things that you can do to really change the world. So I think that from an excitement standpoint, we've never been more excited. Across the country, we have probably about 1,600 core members throughout the city or sites. We have 20 sites throughout the country. And in Washington, D.C., um, there's been great recognition from the chancellor to the, from the mayor to the D.C. City Council that 
these core members, these city or core members, really are play an integral role in helping these schools that are trying to make sure these kids get, it, um, get to graduation. So um, we do believe young people can change the world. Uh, just by a show of hands, who's 17 to 24 years old in the room? Great. Well, you should talk to Daryl. Daryl in the red jacket is one of our core members. Um, if you're interested in learning about giving back to your community, our core members really come from high school graduates to college graduates, so anywhere in between. So um, it's a great year because not only are you giving back to the community, you end up making an even bigger impact on yourselves because it's really a leadership development program as well. And so the, the young lady uh, closest to the door, who's looking at me like I'm crazy now, didn't raise her hand because she just turned 25, but she's also, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, she was a core member as well. Uh, so you guys have some context. So uh, what's interesting about um, your, your comments is I think sort of focusing on the promise uh, that, that young people sort of offer when we think about what service means. Um, we are often presented with what um, seem to be mutually exclusive um, options, uh, particularly those of us who are graduated from college. We can either sacrifice and serve or we can be selfish and make money. Um, and I think about this as I read uh, Ms. Lindsay's bio. Um, she is incredibly impressive. Uh, she has a JD as well as an MBA. Um, she started out in finance and, and left finance to go work in uh, recruiting um, and has done that in several capacities. So I'd like you um, to talk uh, to two points. One is how it is that young people um, deal with that um, challenge, a perceived challenge maybe, um, and then how it is that you have, uh, I guess, the opportunities and challenges in helping to start a nonprofit. Right. Um, okay. Um, so I, I think in terms of being, I, I really think it's about following one's passion while um, w being in a position to, to live well. Um, and for living well, you know, it depends on who you are. For some people that means, you know, making $200,000. For some people it's making 50000 But I think... Um, for me, in pursuing my passion, it was really about figuring out what I was good at and then being in a position to pursue it. And I think that comes from developing skills early on, getting exposure early on, and you know, accessing opportunities and experiences that can pos position you for anything else. And so I think for the young people in the room, who I feel like with the millennial generation and younger groups, they're much more focused on service, they're much more focused on their communities. You're more likely to hear, you know, someone in high school started a nonprofit or a program that they want to, you know, when they graduate, they want to go to law school and then they want to start a nonprofit. There's just a, a push with this generation. Um, and I think for, the, for young people, I think it's important that you get um, those critical skills to make that happen and to be basically to realize your full potential. To be able, and I, I guess it's not, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're 25 or if you're 35 or you're 45, you really do have to have those skills to be able to build um, really what you're fully capable of if you have a little bit of patience. And I think that leads into the second part of what you were asking about launching a nonprofit. So I had the, I've had the opportunity over the last year to launch a, non, a nonprofit, New York Needs You. It was not my idea. Um, in fact, the, the founder works for an investment bank and he continues to do so. Um, and I think that came from, frankly, taking time to build skills. It was first in finance, I then moved into MBA admissions and recruiting at, at a bank, and then I ran programs for an organization, Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And I it was able to build a skill set to be able to run an organization. I was able to build relationships with others. I was able to work at a nonprofit and actually see what went well and what pitfalls there were. Um, and so we, we launched, basically I came on board full time in last October. And in that time we've raised, as of last night we had our bene first benefit dinner, we've raised like $1.7 million. And um, it's remarkable and people are like, wow, you're really good at this. I'm like, no, 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 I stay in my lane. I know what I'm good at and what I, I'm, I, I am, it is professional development of young people is something I'm passionate about and I can do it from sun up to sundown plus some. Fundraising, I can do it, I'm solid at it, but I needed to join an organization where there were other people who were gonna help me fundraise. Um, we work with young people, right? Someone's gotta source those young people. So we partnered with the City University of New York Literally, we have a liaison at each of the schools. And so it's, I think that that's really important in the same way as 
for personally for me to be successful, I have to build certain skills, right, and, and resources, et cetera, for myself. It's the same thing for an organization. We know organizationally what we're good at, and we've gone out and gotten partners to help us with all those other things, including Pepsi, which um, we got a Pepsi refresh grant in February, when at that point, I think we had raised about $150,000 or $200,000. And so that was, it, it was more than, you know, 10% of, of, of what we had raised at that point. So it was really significant for us. Um, and again, I think partnerships are important because out of that, obviously the money was great, but we got a commercial on ABC. You know, we got access to a Taproot grant for them to help us with our marketing. And so I think for us, we are, we are going to continue to, to, to really pursue opportunities to partner with other people and other organizations um, so that our reach can really grow. Thank you for that. Um, so we've talked a lot about service generally um, and, and mostly in the domestic context, uh, in particular thinking about Atlanta. Um, Adriana, you work uh, globally. Um, can you talk about sort of the connections between, I guess, the connections and the gaps when we think about what service means both domestically and internationally? If I can work the microphone, we can talk about it. Great. Um, sure. So, so I work at the United Nations Foundation, which is just north of here um, in DuPont Circle, or west of here. Um, and what we do is all about you know, connecting people to support the work of the UN. Um, and it's not as bureaucratic as it sounds. It's really, we're talking about global health issues. You know, we're talking about polio and measles and malaria. We're talking about access to clean energy. We're talking about supporting livelihoods and education for adolescent girls. Um, these are the global issues that we're tackling day to day. And um, for us, you know, I think that it's an interesting distinction between international versus domestic. And the way that we look at it, quite frankly, is we live in an interconnected world. You know, we are all global citizens and we all have a role to play in that. Um, we are all affected by global health issues. Uh, we are all affected by the energy crisis, um, whether we're here or we're in China. And so knowing that and knowing that there, there are, you know, people and groups out there that, that are interested in this and you know, we're here to really find those opportunities to connect people to those huge global issues. Um, and I fundamentally don't, you know, I think that there, it's not an either or. Um, that it's not, you know, you're not only focused on domestic issues or only focused on global issues. I think um, as global citizens, quite frankly, we should all be focused on all. Um, but obviously there are things that resonate with, with certain people and certain of us and there are certain skills and roles that we have and ways that we know we can put our key assets uh, or our key talents to use in the best and most effective way. I think as the UN Foundation you know, looks at how we engage people in these major huge global issues, it's really all about um, some of the things that have already been discussed about, you know, breaking it down into simple, easy messages and tangible ways for people to get involved. Um, I think some of what was talked about already around people knowing that you have power and knowing that, you know, that we all can make a difference and have a role to play, but we don't know where to begin. That's true and perhaps to, you know, even a larger degree on an international in an international conversation because I think it can feel so overwhelming um, and people feel that they, how could you possibly impact the life of, you know, a small child living in Africa or, you know, a, a young girl living in Guatemala, you know, how could you possibly have any impact and that's really our work. Our work is about creating public awareness, you know, advocacy, fundraising, campaigns and coalitions that can, you know, draw people in, whether it's the National Basketball Association, who's one of our partners in bringing in, you know, players, athletes, so, and so forth, all the way to, down to, you know, working with schools, boys and girls clubs, you know, people around the country, young people around the country, and really getting them involved and letting them know that not only do they have the power to affect change, but they have the power to affect change on a global level. And I think, quite frankly, what you see when or what we have seen, I should say, when, when we've had the opportunity to do that is when individuals feel empowered to make change on a global level, it's going to be that much uh, easier for them to see their, their power at a local level. 
So we really see them being, you know, hand in hand. I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the uh, mentioning of, of, of how sometimes thinking about getting engaged and serving can be daunting. Um, in the nonprofit realm, generally, we're always talking about coalition building and organizing, things that you guys have talked about, finding partners. Um, Quentin, can you talk about, from the perspective of a young professional, um, how it is that you decided to pursue a career um, that's anchored by service? Sure. Um, it's funny. I'm, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm really grounded on this concept that uh, Dr. West talks about, uh, Dr. Cornell West, excuse me, in a lot of his books. Um, but it, it's just very simple, and it says you can't lead the people if you aren't willing to serve the people. You can't serve the people if you aren't willing to love the people. Um, and so you're thinking about those things of like service and leadership and love. Um, it really kind of grounds um, kind of everything that I've done so far uh, in that. Um, like David said, I, I mean, I am pretty young. Um, he said I graduated from Howard. I'm not graduated yet. I'm actually a senior this year. Um, but uh, in 2007, I actually made a tough decision that I don't recommend other people make. Um, but I actually dropped out of school and worked on the, uh, on the Obama campaign. Um, so I traveled across the country and got votes and got uh, President Obama elected. Um, but then, you know, afterwards I had to go back to school and get involved in other places. Um, and so in 2009, I was a CBCF intern on Capitol Hill. Um, and the skills that I learned working for Representative Kilpatrick uh, from Detroit were extreme and it really prepared me to understand the commitment that, you know, people make uh, revolving around love and service for their communities. Um, and so when you talk about making a commitment to serve, uh, you have to look at it in different ways. You know, uh, Stephanie mentioned looking at uh, politics and, and getting involved with advocacy is a different approach. Um, the way I look at it is, you know, we've all been given certain gifts and certain talents. And if you don't use those to help people, then, you know, what are you doing? You know, why are you wasting your time? And when you talk about the decisions of, you know, what do I want to major in to go get a job and make a lot of money? You know, the, the thing you the thing I really value um, from a lot of my mentors, people like Dave and other folks who have given me advice, is that you need to start evaluating um, what your purpose is in life in a sense that is it revolving around money or accomplishments or can you actually measure your commitment um, based on how other people's lives improve around you? And so if you can sit back and say that I know people's lives around me are improving, then you're doing a good job and you're serving others in whatever capacity that may be. Um, but I think as young people, it is tough um, because a lot of our parents were, you know, denied access and opportunities to go out and make lots of money or have certain jobs. So, you know, as kids coming up, it's like, hey, you know, our parents want us to actually be a CEO or, or go make a lot of money because they weren't able to. Um, but I, I think it's really interesting that our generation has said, you know, that that's possible, but we also can make a huge difference that, uh, you know, some folks didn't. Um, I mean, if, if you look at the current economy, I mean, our the older generation is leaving us in a, the worst uh, economic condition ever. And so the concept of going out and joining this capitalistic approach um, to the American society is it's kind of not as possible as it, it you know it once was so you know I, I think it's it's a combination of a lot of different things uh, David when it comes to choosing to serve choosing to uh, commit yourself to this kind of work um, but I think our generation's on the right path and and I think it's going to take more leadership people in this room um, people committing to city and other programs so um, so yeah so two quick observations before we turn this over to you guys, and you guys are responsible now for carrying this and making it a conversation. I flagged that for those of you who came in late, so everybody knew that it's now your responsibility to engage. Um, but I didn't set this up intentionally, but noticed that um, the conversation sort of progressed in a way that went down generationally. Um, <laughs> despite the breadth of um, both, both just an observation, um, despite the breadth of experience that's reflected in your professional and personal experiences, we um, had a, a conversation that was sort of bookended by um, Earl, your points and, and, and your points with regard to a, a lot of this being anchored by a couple of essential things. One is um, being passionate uh, about the work you do and the people you serve. Um, two, you talked about staying in your lane, sort of identifying your skills, that which makes you tick that what you're passionate about and, and, and what you can bring to a project. And I think the third one um, is finding partners to help in that process. Um, before we take our first question, I'd like to ask the uh, first four panelists, um, because we talked a lot about youth and, 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 and said a, a bunch of things that were targeted to youth. How can um, the non-millennials, 
um, the, the wise and mature in the audience um, with all of their respective responsibilities, how can they get engaged? What are some ways in which um, older people, busy people, professional people can serve? Can um, I just say I'm glad you put me at the youth <laughs> point? I just want to point that out. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm good over here. But I'm the youngest of the old. Of the old, yes. <laughs> I think I started a fight unnecessarily, I apologize. Um, but to anyone who'd like to respond. You know, I think that's a good point because I was sharing earlier with someone that I went into corporate America out of um, college. Uh, I had a civil engineering degree. And I chose civil engineering because I needed to make money. I came from a poor background. I, I just needed to make money and I felt that that was a field that would allow me to do so. And it did, but all the time, I felt that I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing. So I volunteered here and I volunteered there. I was volunteering everywhere and working hard. And I ended up in the telecommunications industry. And in 2001, it was flaming out. I raised my hand and said, I'll take early retirement. I was so happy. I was sad, don't get me wrong, that it was flaming out. But I was so happy that I, could, I was finally being forced to get out of an industry that I wasn't supposed to be in because my passion was for serving and I especially wanted to work with children. So I went right into volunteering at the First Year of Atlanta as I did consulting on the side. And eventually after several years of uh, volunteering, I was able to go to work there. But I brought with me skill sets that I had learned in corporate America. A lot of small nonprofits, especially those that are serving children, sometimes do not accomplish all they need to accomplish because they don't have the skill sets. You know, they can't do the computer things that need to be done. I learned how to negotiate. So, you know, I was able to call people and win people over. I learned how to do matrix managing as well as hierarchical type managing. Those are important skill sets when you have a staff of two and you have work that needs to be done by 15 or 20 people. You've got to learn how to bring people in, make them feel apart, get them as engaged, and help them grow and feel that they have accomplished something. So it was good for me to start in corporate America. I just didn't know that at that time. But the skill sets that I brought into this nonprofit business, and it is a business, and we must think like that. When you're serving people, think of it as a business. If you think of it as a business, you put the processes in place so that when you're gone, the business continues to go. And I got that from corporate America. So, so let's, I want to welcome help. others to join in. And, and, and in the final remarks, I also ask you that question again, how can people be served? But I want to see if there's any questions in the audience. If not, I have a whole lot we can continue to engage. OK, so here are my rules for engagement. And then I will go to, to Mr. Strafford, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't direct it to one person on the panel, this is a smaller room, this is intimate, so I won't be as truculent as I usually am, but please ask a question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question, but I don't know if it's going to throw off what you were. That's all right, we'll work with okay. it. Okay. I do have a question. You said direct, and I, 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 I'd like to follow up with this audience. All of this talk about service and the sure. talk about giving back, and I think from what I hear, she takes them as the youngest of age seven. So you've had a chance. That's a very good question, and because I've been around with this organization for almost its full 10-year history, I am seeing that our young people who have gone off and gone to college, and several of them have gotten scholarships through our program, some of them are coming back to serve, not to work. They already have jobs, thank goodness, but they're coming back to serve. Let me give an example. A young man just wrote an essay for a scholarship with an I won't say the beverage company. 
It's no, but. no, can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he said that he had learned through the uh, first T code of conduct to have empathy, to have empathy for people. And because he had empathy, he wanted to serve. And so in that, he said for a lot of the young people in the first city of Atlanta, when they want to get volunteer service, and want to say, I volunteer, they say, I'll be a junior coach. In other words, I'm 16, I'll work one to seven or eight year olds. But he said that one day he saw that we really needed help sweeping and cleaning the clubhouse. So when he asked to volunteer to coach, and we said, well, okay. He said, what do you need for me to do? I need you to help me sweep. I need you to help me mop this floor. He said, I chose to do that. So what you want people to do is understand that all service is honorable. And that's what we're trying to teach them. And a lot of people want to serve up here. You know, I'm the this or the that. But it's a lot of service that needs to be done way down here. And that's what we're trying to get these children to understand. And he said he got that through just over and over being bombarded with the rules of conduct. And he learned to have empathy. Jeff, can you respond to that question as well? Sure. Um, just a couple thoughts that came with this. Um, so Martin Luther King said, everyone can be great because everyone Bless can you. serve. And I think that that really resonates with myself and I think with folks that decide to serve. Everyone has different reasons for doing it. Um, at City Year, just looking Bless across you. the gamut of core members that decide to do this, you know, we have everybody for someone who just got their GED or finished high school to someone who's deferring uh, going to Harvard Law School that next year. So I mean, it really spans the gamut. I think at this age, I think this is the reason why this has become so popular among young people, is you have this opportunity in your lives to really give back a year uh, to the community. And what ends up happening is, which is interesting, is that 17 and 24 year olds end up becoming the role models for the adults. Because the adults are sitting here watching, admiring what you're doing, and maybe thinking back in the time when they did it, or maybe thinking back, I wish I would have done this when I was your age. Um, I would say about 60 to 70 percent of my staff, which is a full-time staff, not core members, were once core members with City Year. Um, so they came back, so service kind of became ingrained in them. Um, and I think that regardless of what you do, you could serve for a year and go on to other careers, which a lot of people do. But we end up finding that a lot of these young people that serve for a year with us, they end up studying education policy or getting their masters in public policy or getting involved in education policy or getting involved in social work because this service, as I say, you're making an impact on the community and makes an even big, bigger impact on yourself. And I think that, that this age range that you're in is such an important one to be doing something like that. So I think that you don't have to pick one or the other that if you're going to serve it means you're not going to be able to be great or accomplish great things or have that high paying job at some point. But to service, I think, is in our DNA, and I think that to have that ingrained in you to do it at this age will have an impact and ripples, when we call, later on. You could be the CEO mm -hmm. of a company later on, but you did that your service, and you're going to continue throughout your life and still can, making a lot of money and still serving your community and your fellow human beings. So I think that that's something really important to keep in mind. That's Stephanie. Um, Jeff, and I think the point Jeff is making is such an important one because, and, and it's a it's a cliche, but it's. I think it's a cliche because it's true that when you do good, you'll do well. And, and often you'll find that volunteering and serving will end up holding you in very good stead later on. It, it often offers you opportunities to do things that someone would not pay you to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you can work in different organizations and with different groups and develop skills that you would never be able to develop um, in, the, in the working world. Um, but it also, I think, especially if you start off doing it um, at a younger age, it really does, I think, prepare you for, for all sorts of things that, ev that even a higher education won't necessarily prepare you for. And it gives you a broader field from which to, to move into um, uh, either the area that you want to move into or will open you up to things that you hadn't even considered. Um, when, when I was, um, this was years ago, I was, I, I was a lawyer and I was a law professor and I was on this track and I was going to, you know, I was on a tenure track and I was going to do this and I was going to make this much money and I was going to, and I was offered a position in the Clinton administration. And I thought, mm, I'd have to, first of all, I'd have to, you know, leave my job, I'd have to move, I'd have to take a big pay cut. Um, I don't think, so. this is not really what I wanted to do. And my father gave me some excellent advice. He said, he told me, you don't have a choice. He said, you really don't have a choice. There are times where some, this is a calling. 
this is not just a, you know, this is not just a job. This is a calling, and you're you're being asked to serve, and that's one of the most important things that you can do in life. And you will be fine. Yes, you'll take a pay cut, and you'll have to move, but you'll be fine. And he and he said, when when you do good, you will do well. Things will this you know different things will open up to you that you hadn't even hadn't even occurred to you. So I did it. I moved from Ohio to Chicago. I took this job. It opened up so many other areas for me that never would have occurred to me to even do. That's how I ended up back in Washington, working in government, working in politics, and doing things that I never even thought I could do. Um, it really ch completely changed my whole life. Um, and, but I think what was important about it was that I did it for the right reason. And I think when we, when we serve, when we make choices based on not how much money we're going to make, um, and, and of course we all have to be mindful of, of, of finances and, and you know, no one's expecting everyone, you know, we're not saying take vows of poverty, but I think it's a mistake um, for especially um, younger folks to make their career decisions based solely on how much they're going to make. Um, and I used to counsel students, uh, counsel my law students, and you know, they'd come to me and say, well, I, you know, I have an opportunity to, you know, go to this law firm and make a gazillion dollars, but I really want to work in, you know, the public sector. And, and I would and ask them, what would, what would, if the money were the same, what would you want to do? And then I would tell them, do what it is that, that feeds your heart, because um, if you don't, if you're just going for the money, you will find that what you will use the money, the money is really, really good for, it will pay for your therapy that you need to get out of the bed, you know, to just manage to get out of the bed every morning to go to this job that you are not happy with. And, there, yeah, so, so follow your heart and, and I think, um, and remember to, that when you do good, you will do well. Whether or not you're going to work for the greater good or choose to go into corporate America, but the reality is there are so many people that not only don't have that choice, but if they were to go to school, their choice would be to make money, particularly to fix the vices within their community, whether or not that is the right way to do it. So I guess I just want to ask, how do you engage individuals that aren't necessarily as educated or feel that you must need, you need an education to serve your community? How do we, I guess, bring the same enthusiasm to individuals that on a, um, I guess some people may argue on a grassroots level, but on a community level can say, regardless of whatever, whatever, whatever degree I have or do not have, or what my status is, um, I can still serve within my community um, and not necessarily, as you said, take this vow of poverty. And, or, or how can we express that it's okay that financially you may be poor, but, but spiritually you can still you'll be serve. rich. <laughs> I know that's right. That's a good question. Let's get Mr. Stafford to yeah. jump in first, and then we'll go to Quinn. I, I'm a little concerned, or, or, or this thought that they that they have to be mutually exclusive, right. doing well and doing good, you know, education and doing good. I believe that at whatever level, everyone is a, is is capable of providing and contributing to the society, to the community, and providing some good, and and, and the level that you do that. Uh, depends on you, and it depends on your passion and how how fervent you are in pursuing your, your your passion. You know what your values are. If you if you put material goods and and those type things over uh, serving, uh, that's an individual call. But I think we need to go back and realize that everyone can do a little good. You might not you might not start a 501c3. You might not feed 50,000 people, but you can feed one. You see. And so I think we need to put it in, in that context. The other thing I'd like to add on uh, uh, quickly is that one of the things I think is lacking in all this uh, when we talk about nonprofit, uh, uh, volunteerism, and doing good is collaboration. Uh, there's been a plethora of, of, of uh, nonprofit organizations rising in the last 10 to 15 years in the minority community and, and well-intentioned, but lack capacity and lack impact. But it's important then that we look at each other. If we're really concerned about having impact and, and making a contribution, then why aren't we working together? Why are we trying to do this when we can do this well and those next to us can do this? So I, I think we need to start collaborating and finding out how can we work together to have a greater impact in the community. So uh, 
Point of personal privilege before you respond, Quentin. Um, I, I appreciate your question, clearly because it sparked a conversation that we need to have. Um, having set up the dichotomy, I did so because I wanted to have this conversation, but through personal experience, I know it not to be true. I am the product of a single parent home. My mom is actually, for the first time that I've done the ALC in five years, is sitting right here. Um, from Los Angeles, California, left school when I left LA when I was 18 to go to school in, in New York. I went to Columbia University. Um, something that I struggled with greatly was that after I graduated, I became an elementary school teacher. And if I could often say, I said this on a panel yesterday, if I could paint, I would paint the pictures of my friends' faces when I said to them I was going to teach. The disappointment, the confusion, the frustration that came with that conversation of saying, here's somebody who went to school, who came from a community where you're supposed to go make money to help where you came from, and I was signing up to become broke. What I didn't know at the time was that my mother, what she would say to me often when I would call and I would be frustrated is, I just want you to do whatever's gonna make you happy. That frustrated me like nothing else. Why? Because I didn't know what that meant. I knew how to get good grades, how to navigate systems, how to develop relationships. Happiness was not a part of the equation, which is, I think, what everybody on the panel was saying. Passion, staying in your lane, identifying what makes you tick. Once I identified that I was passionate about education and I found myself in front of a classroom of young kids, some of those other real concerns became less consequential. And the thing that's most important about it is that fast forward four years later, I'm now working in federal policy, still very much in a service capacity, to be clear, not making anything near what I could make in the corporate sector or somewhere else, but I'm very comfortable. So it's very, very possible to do both. I think sometimes it takes being able to delay the gratification and make sacrifices. But I just want to acknowledge for the sake of having this conversation that they're very inclusive. Right. To so the sister's point, I very, I'm very, the privilege. I'm wondering if I misunderstood the question because I thought the question is how do you motivate folks that don't have work? Right. No, it is. That, and that's why I say I appreciate the privilege there. And then we're going to go to Quentin. And then I also want you to talk about how it is that you do that work in um, developing nations where individuals don't have access to the same privilege that I've been fortunate to benefit from. So, no, you understand it perfectly. And, and I, so. One thing I want to say before I get to your question is, for some reason, there's this concept that if you work for underserved people or people who don't have or serving your community, that you somehow can't look nice or drive a nice car or make a lot of money. And that's like a misconception. Like, why did the rich people who have and, like, um, and have made it get better representation than the poor people? And that's a question we all got to gotta battle. It's like, why do we think that because we're serving, we can't make the same amount of money that somebody who's on Wall Street makes? And we got to change that dichotomy like when this conversation, because that's totally false. Do you think that people who serve here and who are working in service capacities in DC aren't making lots of money and aren't, um, I mean, they are privileged, and I, I'm going to get to that point in a second, but I think we have to step away from tying service to not making X amount of money. Because I think you can be very comfortable and do great work. Because I see it every day um, with people who run great organizations in this city. But they're not poor. They're not taking pay cuts. Um, there has to be accountability to say, again, are people's lives who I'm representing and working for getting better? And I think that's the question we got to ask when it comes to work. Um, but getting back to the point of like, uh, you know, how do you talk to those who don't have? You know, growing up, I think. Some of my greatest mentors and leaders in the community were uh, my barbers and my basketball coaches and my teachers in high school who didn't go to college, who didn't have um, great degrees, but whose, um, whose, whose value to me was more than somebody else who might have had those qualifications or whatever you call them. Um, and so I think the way we must do that is we must promote those people. Um, as well as we promote other folks who may have those same degrees and, and qualifications and privilege. Um, but I think it has to be a balancing of, you know, people like us being um, personal advocates and, and, and what I like to call uh, being viral, you know, going out and being word of mouth. Like, this is what we want our community to look like. This is what the people we want to value in our community. Um, and it starts with us. Adriana, can you talk about how it is that you and developing nations work with non-privileged people in order to get them actively involved in service? Sure. I think um, it's an interesting point because often, and there might be people in this room who know this very well as well, that 
the sense of volunteerism and service can be very different in different cultures. We have a very specific sense of it, or we're, it's becoming a very specific sense um, of who does volunteerism and who has the opportunity to do service and who should be doing service. Um, when, if I can speak from my personal experience in going to Africa several times over the last five years, uh, many times a year, working with communities to get nets, I mean simple mosquito nets out to every single child under the age of five to prevent them from getting malaria. The sense of service there is a little bit different um, in the sense of, you know, this is a, it's a huge effort to get three million nets distributed in the course of a, of a week, which is what these countries are doing, and it's, it's massively incredible. And it starts at the government level, and it spreads out from there in terms of getting clinics involved, clinicians involved. And what we've seen more and more, and I think this is, it's, this is very relatable to a U.S. context as well, in many respects, it's the faith communities in a lot of these countries that are in the countries I've been to who are really mobilizing people to help and to support and to support, you know, getting the nets distributed, educating um, individuals on how to use the nets, these sorts of things. Um, and I think that for us has been so valuable to learn and to see in the development, you know, global health community that there is such an important and strong role for the faith community to play when you look at, you know, 40% of all healthcare in the developing world is provided by faith organizations of one type or another. Um, and I think some of that is relevant and, or is, uh, you know, relatable to, to our context here. And it brings me to, in the U.S., what we're doing or how we strive to access communities who might not be the easiest to reach and give them opportunities to partake in this, you know, in global issues. It is all about partnership, which was your third issue that you brought up. You know, on all fronts, on both the domestic side and the international side, it's all about partnership and working with people who can, you know, get your issue and your message um, and, you know, your cause in front of perhaps a an, an, an group that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to reach. Um, so we have a lot of examples of that at the UN Foundation, you know, groups that we're working with. Um, I mentioned, you know, if it's the Boys and Girls Club or the Girl Scouts with, you know, engaging young girls and how they can help shape the futures of adolescent girls abroad, you know. And so those are some of the things I think are important on both the U.S. side and an international side. It's all about partnering with people who can help you get those messages out. Perfect. Uh, just a quick check in. We have about 25 minutes left to uh, continue this conversation. I know Stephanie wants to get in. I'll ask her to respond as concisely as possible. And then the next question should be directed to Nicole. So whoever has a question for Nicole, raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, well, Adriana touched on this. I think, I think you're both raising a very important point in, which causes us to really think about how are we defining service. Um, and I think to a lot of people, service is really defined as a non-paying job, like something that you go, you have to go do, and it's a very job-like activity that you're not being paid for. Um, but I think that there are so many different ways to serve, and so to go to your question about how can someone, you know, in a community who, you know, might not have the education or might not have these resources, how, you know, how can we get them, how can we encourage them to serve? I think that involves redefining service in, in the minds of a lot of people. And service can be, you know, you know, reading to a child, reading to your neighbor's child. Service can be going to, you know, get groceries for an elderly neighbor or just looking in on them to make sure that they're okay. Um, there are all sorts of ways that we can serve. And the, there are um, organized ways to do it. And a lot of the organizations, uh, uh, and, and probably some of the organizations that are represented here have created really great mechanisms that make it easy to do, that you don't really have to work, you don't have to go through a lot of trouble to, to do the work. You can go somewhere and they have it all set up for you and you just, you know, if you can do it an hour a day or whatever, you can just do it. But we've got to recognize that service can, is all sorts of things and it's something we can all do, even if it's just helping a neighbor um, in, in, with something that they need. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. America and having a business in the inner city of America, I continue to see communities, the inner city with blighted conditions, 
drugs, crime, hopelessness. How do we prevent our young people from continuing to be a product of their environment? Yeah, I'm sorry, I set you up on that one, so yeah. I'd like you to respond. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that you can necessarily avoid that, right? We are, we are a collection of our experiences, but I think what we need to, to do is that we need to make sure that there are positive experiences to counterbalance the negative ones. Um, and so, you know, there, there was the really early question was around, you know, how do you get people that are not millennials engaged and I think that it's kind of generations or half generations passing it down to the one, next one. So it's not a, necessarily this, you know, baby boomers, 60 years old, working with 20 year olds, but it's 60 year olds working with 50 year olds or 40 year olds and 40 year olds working with 30 year olds. And I think that what that does is for 30 somethings, right? We, we look to 40-something saying, oh, wow, you know, I, I, I really want to know what that person's saying, right? There's this reverence for that person who's just one step ahead of you because you feel like they can relate. And I think that's what's exciting about um, this new movement is I think now you have a lot more young people, 20-year-olds, working with 15-year-olds and 14-year-olds being able to say, look, I was there, and you do have a choice. Whereas when your parent tells you you have a choice, you're like, you don't know what I'm going through. And I, I, with our organization, so we, we work with first-generation college students, but 82% of them are low income, 46% live below the poverty line. So I think these are students in, in our program that are living in those communities as well, and they've decided to do something different, right? Family of seven making $20,000 a year, that child is still choosing to go to college, right? And that's a big commitment. But that child, well, he's not a child anymore. He's that young man, he needs to give back to his community and so, so that that 14-year-old who feels like he doesn't have a choice is able, is able to see that positive um, role model. So I, I, you know, I think there are a lot of things outside of kind of volunteerism service related to improving communities, right, that go probably beyond the scope of this. But I do think as it relates to service, there's a kind of passing down from one person to the next. And, and the last thing is I, I do think this relates back to this other point. With com we talk about community, but it's really one-on-one. -on -one. If you go back to the Obama campaign, really, you know, it wasn't, Obama didn't get, you know, the 46-year-old woman that I saw in North Carolina to go get, to vote. He inspired somebody to go to their community to then go and talk to that 46-year-old woman and tell her that, you know what, you want to go out and vote. He didn't, he, you know, his message, she wouldn't have voted for the first time. This woman, 46 year old, years old, voted for the first time. And it was because her community was really like in her face, like, okay, we've got to make this happen. And I think that's how you, you know, in, even in terms of making decisions, you have, you have to reach people one-on-one -on -one and give them a reason and, and an experience that makes them want to continue that. I know Ms. Hawkins wants to get in, and then let's, I think there was a question on this side of the room. Yes, ma'am. Then we'll go back there. Yes, and if, sir. I think he wanted to clarify. I'm, I'm not oh, did I miss it? Yeah. I see things get worse. Yeah. I don't see I it get better yeah. in the inner cities of America. Okay. Uh, so what's the question? Well, it was, I, I asked the question, you know, how do we solve that problem? Because Is that what you were going to respond to? Right. So let's right. do that, and then we'll go. We'll make our start I really think it all boils down to the the back. giving children alternative experiences. I, I, she, she touched on it, and I agree with her 100%. I understand exactly what you're saying. We're located in Zone 4 of Southwest Atlanta, one of the highest rates of foreclosure, quite a bit of blight. The, uh, the Zone 4 Police Department is located almost next door to us, and he's clearly told me, I'm here for you, but don't call me for the small stuff, because I'm dealing with big stuff, okay? But the business in the neighborhood, the Cascrack Cake Grill, the lady says to me, I wish you could get more of these children here in this neighborhood in your first tee. She said, because when the children come along here that are not in your first tee on their way to the pool, they're cussing, they're saying all kinds of stuff. It's awful. She said, but your children come in here and they're so respectful. You know, she said, I, I just wish you could get more of them in there. It's the experiences we have got to provide alternative experiences for our children. It does not require that you have a large program, but as you were saying, one-on-one, -on -one, but it's got to be where they get an opportunity to see something different. 
And we are not going to get better if we don't start that and do it early. We got to get into the schools and do it. And the first tee has a program where they're doing it in the school. But the bottom line is you don't have to be a first tee. You have to have care for children, and you've got to give them those experiences early in life. Uh, Mr. Cosby, Bill Cosby, got in a lot of trouble a couple of years ago um, in, in essentially using a phrase called putting bodies on them. Um, in my observation, it was him sort of reacting to the fact that over time he's seen the generations that um, were, were just talked about uh, abdicate some of their responsibilities, in particular um, being meaningful um, role models in the lives of young people. And so I think in addition to um, using organizations like those that are represented on the panel to provide experiences, it, it, it's also uh, incumbent upon all of us to put our bodies physically on young people in order to help steer them in another direction. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I apologize if this question has been already asked before because I was a little late. But I wanted to know how do you go about engaging um, persons that are in professional organizations to move them towards service? I was brought up, raised by my mom in terms of seeing her do service from PTA with very little education and everything that she did. So I'm very engaged in that. But I'll give you a specific example, and maybe uh, Jeff from City Year can start with the, the answer. I, was, I won't name the organization, but we were, um, we were just told just to get volunteers for three hours to help out at City Year um, just for a very limited time here in D.C. And it was like pulling teeth from the dentist for me to get people out of an organization that has 300 to 500 people who can afford to do it by way of profession. And so I'm about wanting to do it, but I don't know how to do so it. So let's go there. Jeff, how? <laughs> wow. Um, well, I, mean, I can tell you how adults have gotten involved with city years. I said that the core members, these young people, oftentimes stand as role models for the adults. We'll do ser physical service projects throughout the community, which may have been similar to what you got involved in. So we we'll probably do at least one physical service project every month, which will be at a community center or a school, and the core members along with the volunteers will paint murals, build park benches, whatever the principal asks us to do, we'll do to make more of a positive environment for the kids to come to. And so days like Make a Difference Day in October, is it October 23rd? October 23rd to make a difference day in which we have our core members as well as external young people and adults come and volunteer with us. Martin Luther King Day is one of our biggest physical service days. Last year we had uh, over 700 people attend that service day. And that could be a great way, especially for someone that maybe had to push them to serve. They maybe become, I've had seen many people come to these service days become so inspired by it and want to get more involved and find other ways they can get involved. So that would be a way that I've seen the, the adult community get involved with, with service. Yes, sir. How you doing? My name is Bashir Jones uh, from Cleveland Radio 1, talk show host out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, the issue that we're dealing with in Cleveland is the, the, uh, the number of schools that are being shut down. Um, transformation plan that's taking place right now in, in Cleveland. I think the inner city is getting better, but like you said, it, it's imperative that we encourage the community to uh, to get more involved in the schools and stop just blaming the teachers. We got to get more involved. So I guess my, my question is, is how important is education uh, to, to the overall structure of the city in general? Because we're seeing that education, it, it starts there. So how important is that and what are you all doing to uh, to be of assistance? Nicole, can you take first crack at that? Um, well, let me first say, I, I it, kind of my whole theme of staying in your lane, I, I, I work with young adults, right? I, I like when I can talk to them and they're grown and I, I don't have to worry about, um, we work a lot on self-esteem and confidence, but I, there's a difference when someone's, you know, 18 to 24 versus 12. Um, I, my parents are old school, so I think education is, is everything. Um, I, you know, there are people who are, you know, you're starting to read articles, um, having been in higher administration for a while, you're starting to read articles where they're saying, you know, does someone need a college degree? Um, you know, maybe not. I, I can't really fathom that, and I, I, so I read the articles and they seem kind of silly to me, um, understanding the access that I've had just by, you know, before I even had a college degree, just being in school, the things that people would offer to me, right, and, and the exposure that I had, um, you know, through inroads and other things, because I was a college student, um, it's it's hard for me to see how that's not the of ultimate importance. So I, I think it is important. Um, I think particularly for underserved communities, um, that is how you gain access, um, credibility, etc. So um, I do think 
that it, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I really feel like it is the core um, that, you know, is a jumping off point. And I think particularly for people who, you know, their parents didn't have something or they did, forget, maybe they didn't have parents. I, we have a lot of kids in our, our program who are either single parent household or no parent in the house. Jeff, I, I just think it's the key. Sorry. Um, and Jeff, many of your um, core members are students, are youth as well. Can you respond to the gentleman's question as well? Uh, yeah. So I would say first off that you know, education is a great equalizer. And I think that with the achievement gap that's going on, this is like one of the biggest civil rights issues of our time. Um, so our young people that are serving, some of them um, are college graduates, some of them are high school graduates, some are, some are in between. Um, part of what we do with city years after they finish their 1,700 hours or one year of service, they get a $5,300 education award. And you can serve up to two years, so it could be over $10,000 you get towards your education. Um, but, you know, the focus of what we do, aside from trying to help these young people become future leaders, is focus on education in the schools that we're in. And the core members become tutors, mentors, and role models in schools that are really needing this type of support where they have these near peer mentors that are there for them that can help them get through this school and graduate and lead on to the rest of their life. So I just, um, it's, it's a major tenet of what Sidier believes and I think a lot of these core members that come serve with us also believe in it as well because they want to help these young people graduate and move on. Ms. Hawkins, I know you want to get in, but before you do, can you also talk a little bit about Diplomas Now? Sure. Um, so Diplomas Now is, uh, one of the programs that we have in the school is called Whole School, Whole Child, and this is really comprised of a team of about 10 core members that serve in a particular school the entire school year, from the morning bell to the after school program. And they focus on everything from in-school support for the teachers, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, especially focusing on the kids that might be falling behind in attendance behavior or course performance. Diplomas Now is a high school turnaround model. It's a collaborative between city year, communities and schools, and talent development, which is an organization of Johns Hopkins University. The PepsiCo Foundation has helped uh, fund a lot of the research that we've done to create this program. So the basic idea behind it is providing the right intervention to the right student at the right time. So we're serving this year at Spingar, Spingar High School um, and focusing on those students that really are either way behind in terms of where their grades are at or that we can see from their attendance there they're not showing up to school or they're getting a lot of suspensions and getting core members to start focusing on putting that attention on them because the reason behind this is um, I, we call it the ABCs, attendance, behavior, course, performance. If any one of those three factors is um, um, absent from the student by the time they get to the ninth grade, there's almost a 75 to 85% chance that they're going to be a future dropout. And the idea is in the middle school and high school, especially the ninth and tenth grade space, if you can make sure they're on track by the time they get to tenth grade, their chances of graduation go up to about at least 85%. So. Um, Again, speaking to the education space, I think that there's such a recognition from the community, also from you know, the corporate community and also other nonprofits that this is such an important thing that this country needs to focus on. As I mentioned, the dropout rate in this country in the largest urban schools is about 50%. And it's a travesty. And so we all have to ask this question of what part can we play? And from Sidious' perspective, we say young people can play a major role in making sure these kids get on to graduate. So I see at least two more panelists who want to get in. And let me just take a quick, is there anybody else who has a question? I think we might have time for one more question if someone does. You do. Okay, so let's have Ms. Hawkins get in, Quentin. We'll take one final question, and then I'm going to ask the panelists. So we've talked a lot about a range of issues, but uh, I think many of us might still be grappling with the question that the two young right. ladies brought up. So what advice, resources, um, words of encouragement can you provide to those who are here so that when they leave here, they can have conversations with other people about getting involved. So how do we take everything that we've grappled with and talk about making it act actionable? What, what can you give them to take away? Um, so we'll go with Ms. Hawken, then Quentin, and then we'll take your question. Well, I wanted to just add to the educational, but I will also speak to what he just uh, directed me to speak to, and that is, I thought your question was so apropos because I was so poor that I needed to make money because I needed to eat, okay? It was not about driving a big car. I needed to be able to, to that I could put a uh, roof over my head. So I wanted to be a teacher, but I chose to go into civil engineering. But I did say to you that my heart for service kept pulling at me, but it worked out for me because as soon as I could get into full-time service, I ran to it and I brought those skill sets to it. Don't feel bad if you think that you have got to 
take a job because your circumstances dictate that. But you can always serve. You can always serve. And what you should always do is be preparing yourself to do as much service as possible. So there's nothing, all money that you make honestly is okay, especially if you do the right thing with your money. So you may be the one to make money to provide funds for someone else to do something with young children. Because the question about education, the research that I saw says that for African American males, you see that trend starting in the fourth grade when they fall behind. They start off like this and then they fall like that. You've got to get them early. So you got to go into elementary schools. And I mean, for those who are at the high school, you need them there too. But if you can go into elementary schools and target and help children with things that, that are important to them, for example, very quickly, uh, we partnered with another nonprofit organization that I think was being funded by Condoleezza Rice's uh, Families Foundation, Center for New Generation. They were tutoring children at the school. We came in and we said, if they've got good attendance and what have you, we will invite them to the golf course. Golf is very unfamiliar to these children. Golf course, yeah, bring them to the golf course. So on this, around the last day before they're preparing to take the CRCT, those children walked a few blocks down to our golf course. When, we got, when they got there, we had the Atlanta Falcons football players there to play golf baseball with them. They went wild. One little boy started just doing backward flips, okay? <laughs> he had attended tutorial faithfully. He had did all he could do to, in hopes of improving his CRCT scores, and he was rewarded with that experience. Again, positive experiences. They come in all kind of packages. They don't have to be this big, but we all can do something to bring that positive experience in children's lives. Quentin. Um, just to answer the question and, uh, and to also wrap up my comments, um, you know, I think this panel has been uh, a lot about reaching out a hand in service, uh, but sometimes you got to throw out a fist. And I think when it comes to public education and the schools closing across this country in massive numbers, uh, sometimes we have to throw out fists. Um, and I say that in a way that, um, you know, serving people is great, but also advocating for um, better systems for them to be able to improve their lives themselves is another fight that we got to grow into in our service. Um, and so I just think with the public education system, you, you know, one of the things we got to realize is that some states and sometimes our federal government spends twice as much money to build prisons than we do to educate some of our children. Um, and so that value issue has to change, and it may not change by us just volunteering at schools or tutoring, but throwing out fists at local leaders to say, this is our value system as the public, and this is what we're gonna demand. Um, so that's a very pertinent issue. And I think you know there are studies and research uh, to show direct correlations between access to quality education and your performances in uh, you know, high school on state exam tests to get to college, to get to that privilege um, of being able to live a certain lifestyle. But there are direct correlations to some of this stuff. You know? And we gotta get beyond the, um, you know, and I don't mean to, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, but get beyond the making myself feel good about giving back to actually going out and fighting um, for some of these things. And that's what, you know, some of the, that's, that's the way I found uh, my service to be impactful. So not only reach out a hand, but to throw out a fist when necessary. Yes, ma'am, last question. Oh, um, so my question is actually specifically for Nicole. I am um, a couple years out of college, started a nonprofit during college, um, which was working to engage fellow students uh, with work in New Orleans post Katrina. And right now, part of my thinking process is sort of at a stuck stage. You know, I'm a couple years removed, so I'm not in the college type environment, but still feeling engaged to want to do something and trying to figure out how best to use the skills, you know, as, as you were saying earlier, um, to continue to do something. So my question is, number one, how do you best work to assess those skills or those strengths that you have? And after you have done that, how then do you use those to act? Right. So that's a great question. And then congratulations for starting a nonprofit for something that we, we still need a lot of work on. I, I think in, you're, you're already on the right path in knowing that you need to assess your skills. And I, I always encourage people, there are wonderful books out there that, that as a starting point, they, they encourage you to ask questions that you might not normally think about. 
Um, so I, I just start doing work in that area around your strengths, talents, your interests, um, what you want out of not just your, your current job, but the you know five years and ten years down the road. Um, what gets you excited? And you know by starting a nonprofit and now being out of school you have experiences that you can use to rely on. Whereas when you're in college, it's a little bit harder because you, you know, when you get out in the workforce, you learn a lot of different things, right? You, you find out that, you know what, maybe I you know, don't like working with children as much as I thought, whatever it is. So you'll have some experiences that you can rely on in, in trying to figure that out. Um, so I think that's a starting point. I think in terms of, of where, as it relates to your nonprofit, if that was something that you were excited about, you know, just because you're not, not a college graduate doesn't mean that you can't still be in that space. So if there was some energy around working with college students, in particular, you know, why not still work with college students? I, I love being in school. Um, after racking up $112,000 in, in student debt, I knew I couldn't be in school anymore. Um, but I have, I have spent most of my career working with 18 to 24 year olds, right? Because there's so much energy and excitement about life that we tend to lose and I don't want to lose it, right? So even though I am well past college years, I still get that every day with the young people that I work with and I, I think that you can find that um, in, you know, if that's what gave you energy and you were really excited about. It might be with that nonprofit that you started. It might be with another organization, right? There are other places that you can go um, to have those experiences um, and continue to build your skill set because you've got a skill set, but there are other things that you can, can improve on. My unsolicited advice is to beg her for her email address and phone number and make her your mentor. Um, Quentin, why don't we start in reverse order, um, and I'll go back to the question that I've asked. What final um, words of advice or encouragement, resources, or tools will you share so that we can take all that we've talked about in theory and make it actionable in practice? Um, definitely. I'm a big um, product of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, I came to D.C. when I was 14 years old, just traveling and visiting, and I dreamed, like it was my dream, to actually come to the city and work. Um, but it was because of the CBC Foundation uh, that I'm here now, um, like, what, seven, eight years later, it's not a long time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big um, product of the foundation. And I would say, you know, how can we as individuals strengthen institutions to let people grow and operate for themselves? Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, again, service and helping out folks. But how can we change systems, institutions, to allow people to grow themselves? Um, and again, you know, how can we value our worth by, uh, judging our people's lives getting better from what we're doing. Um, so that's what I would say. Adriana Logalbo. Sure. Um, so when it comes to global engagement or global service, um, I think the biggest thing I would say is actually to echo something that Mr. Stafford said earlier, which is it can be very, what seems like very small things. Um, you know, in, in our campaigns, we're talking about just getting educated on the issue, you know, just reading it, just telling somebody else, you know, telling your classmate, telling your, you know, your coworker about any one of these issues that actually is, a, you know, that you're compelled by. Um, and then taking some small action, and it might be a 50 cent donation, you know, where you think it's needed most. So that's what I would, you know, I would say, you know, we've learned the most at it. Our campaigns are ultimately grassroots, and we're raising $30 million over the course, which you mentioned earlier, you know, $30 million over the course of five years, or four years now, and that's literally $10 donations at a time from people all across the country. So um, it can be what seems like very small, and those things add up, and they make huge differences around the globe here in the U.S. as well. And I think in terms of resources, I just like to offer ourselves as a resource. The UN Foundation is a resource for all of you and anyone else that you would like um, to learn more about global issues and how people can get engaged. So it's unfoundation.org. We're on Facebook and Twitter, just like everybody else is at the table, I'm sure. Um, so, so feel free to look us up. Thank you. Nicole Lindsay. Yeah. Um, two things. The, the first is, I, in terms of salary, I've made more in nonprofit than I made in the private sector. And I, I worked at Goldman Sachs. I worked at Wachovia, right? Because I found something that I was very good at, that I love to do, and I'll work harder than anybody else, right? And so I think when you can find that, it might be a nonprofit, it might be government, it might be your own consulting firm, whatever it is, I think that you can make money, right? I'm not gonna get rich, I'm not gonna be a millionaire off of it, but I make more money. So that's the first point. The, the second point is my, my husband 
is a capitalist, full-fledged, right? This man is never going to work for a nonprofit. Um, but this brother is, he's, ser he's serious about his job, but he's one of the most unselfish people that I've ever met. And he is passionate about certain things, like diversifying the organizations in which he works. So every place he has ever worked, he is, when they say we have a job and we're about to start looking for someone, he starts going through his Rolodex, calling friends, like, do you know somebody who has this skill set who I can help, right? And so to me, that is service in the same way, right? Helping someone get a better job to, you know, improve themselves, helping to diversify the organization, which we all know is better for those folks. And he's worked at major organizations. And so I think service, it's important to think about those that, of us that are working nonprofit who make different sacrifices and et cetera. But it's also important that wherever you are and whatever you're passionate and excited about, it, you know, you don't have to quit so that you feel good about your, you know, yourself that, oh, okay, I've done this, right? He is doing way more than people, some people who work in nonprofit. Um, because he's figured out how he can have an impact, a huge impact on that person, but then also on their family and their livelihood. Thank you. Jeff Franco? Uh, okay, so I have a few things. One of them is follow your heart and follow your passion, whatever it is that you do. Um, my story is actually I worked for the fifth, past 16 years I've been in Washington, D.C. The past 13 were in the for-profit sector. I've been in a city here for the past three years. It's been the most gratifying job I ever had. I'm not saying you should work for, for nonprofit. I'm just saying listen to what your heart's telling you to do and go in that direction. The second thing, get a mentor. Many people have said that up here. I have a mentor. Hopefully you have a mentor. If you don't, you should get one. And you should also be mentors for other people. Um, it's been invaluable in my life and in my career to have a mentor, more than one mentor, that I could bounce ideas off of and get guidance from. Third, uh, a term we get sit here we call campfire. We always set a campfire after we have a meeting, which is leave it better than you found it. Um, and I think that that's really can be correlated with service. You know, if you come across somebody, try to impact them or touch them some way and leave them off better off than when you found them initially. Um, and finally, to serve. Again, there's different definitions of service. It could be for an organization. You know, that's what we do at City Year, but it also could be holding the door open for somebody. I mean, that's service, and serve your community. And I'll leave you with one last quote, because I'm just crazy about quotes. Um, Never doubt that a small group of committed, thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is all it ever has. So especially as the young people out here um, who have all this energy and this idealism, really tap into that and uh, you know, go out there and make your mark. Thank you. Stephanie Jones? Um, well, I would, I would frame um, my recommendations in three words. You want to evaluate, you want to educate, and you want to empower. Um, and it's something we've all touched on here, but for, first you want to evaluate your own skills, your interests, what, what your passions are, what you feel good about, because that's going to lead you to where you, where you want to serve. And it's going to be a natural fit. And so that when you do find what your passion is, um, as Nicole says, then it's not, as, it's not really like work. It's just something that you really enjoy doing. It's something that really means something, and you will put the time into it. Then you want to educate. You want to educate yourself and you want to educate those around you about whatever it is you're working on. For example, um, you know, I've been talking about political engagement. You want to educate yourself about the issues. You want to educate yourself about the policies and how they work. And then also educate people around you. Um, you can do that just in conversation. You can do that with a letter to the editor. You can do that by speaking up when you, when you feel passionate about something. And then you want to empower. And again, that's empowering yourself and empowering those around you. But not just those, you can also empower your elected officials, you can empower policymakers to, again, do the right thing, do what, whatever it is, whether it's, it's to advance an education initiative, whether it's to, um, to stop doing something that um, you, you think that they should not be doing. Um, you can empower not just yourself, but those around you and then those in, in the bigger picture. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with, a, with a, just a quick story, uh, one of my favorite stories about starfish. Uh, there, there was a man walking down the, the beach with his daughter. Some of you may have heard this. He was walking down the beach with his daughter, and starfish have been have washed up all on the shore, and they're they're lying in the sun, baking and dying. So she's walking along, and she's picking up a starfish every you know every few steps, and she throws it back into the ocean, and she goes along, throws another one back in the ocean, and the father says, "What are you doing?" And she says, "She said I'm saving the starfish." And he said, honey, you can't save all these starfish. They're, they're, he said, there, there are hundreds of them. They're all dying. You cannot save all these starfish. And she just kept walking, picked up another one, tossed it in, and said, save that one. 
And I think that's what we can all do. There's so many starfish out here. There's so much to do. And I think that's something that's very daunting for us. Um, that we often think, well, there's just, you know, how, how am I going to make a difference? But you can make a difference by doing just, just a few simple things and things that are within your power. And, and think about it as saving the starfish. You can't save all of them, but you can save that one. Thank you. Vanessa Hawkins. Well, I, in my opening, I tried to state the first T code of conduct, and I think I botched it, so I'm going to redo it, and I'm going to read it this time. It says, uh, the first one, respect for myself. In this particular case, I will be physically active, eat well, get enough sleep, and take care of myself so that I can stay healthy, so that I can serve others. Respect for others. I will be friendly, courteous, and helpful so that others will accept my service to them. Respect for my surroundings. I will be careful not to damage anything that belongs to others so that others will think I'm honest and true in my attempts to service them. Follow your passion. Service is the right thing. We're all called to serve. Thank you. Earl Stafford. I think it's all been said very well and eloquently uh, today. There have been so many issues, but I will reiterate, it doesn't take a lot to do a lot. Give a dollar, give an hour. Find your passion and do that. If you don't know what that is or opportunities to do good, uh, we have developed a website that's becoming a portal being launched on September the 30th to match opportunities where you can learn to do good, opportunities to do good, and to go out and to serve. Go to doinggood.com, doinggood.com. Thank you. Um, so actually, so I'll do this real quick housekeeping note. If you guys would walk right outside to the left, there's a table where there's uh, information, including T-shirts about the Doing Good campaign. You can learn more about everything that was discussed. Um, please, before we leave, uh, join me in giving a, a, a big round of applause to our panelists for.